Greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to Indian Trail Presbyterian Church's virtual worship service this week. Uh, today is the first Sunday, in essence, of the church year. It's the first Sunday of Advent. Um, today we begin our journey toward the celebration of the coming of Jesus, his birth in Bethlehem that we celebrate on Christmas. But we also look forward during the season to the coming of Christ again to bring God's kingdom in all its fullness. So today we celebrate the advent, the coming of the Christ. As it is the first Sunday of the month, we are also celebrating communion. Um, we would invite you, if you're as you're worshiping with us virtually, to gather some sort of bread and uh, wine or juice in your home and join us in this festival, this feast that Jesus has prepared for us. Um, you don't have to be a Presbyterian to participate in our communion service and our tradition. Um, our Lord invites all who believe and trust in him to celebrate this sacrament. We begin our worship today um, with a lighting of an Advent candle. Many of you will know that the tradition in churches is to light uh, one additional candle each Sunday of Advent as we mark our way towards the celebration of the coming of the Christ child. Um, we are using a, a liturgy for the lighting of the Advent candles this year from the Presbyterian Outlook. Let us worship God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and set lights in the sky, sun and moon and stars. By these stars, our ancestors charted their journeys. By their, these stars, they knew God was with them. Today, we light one candle to bring the fire of the stars down from heaven to earth to nestle among the green. We name this candle Hope. We too are on a journey. And we do not always know the way, but we chart our path by the star of hope. Even when better days seem far away and the weight of the world seems to crush your promises, we set our face steadily towards the light. Listen now to the prayer of an ancient poet. For God alone, my soul waits in silence, for my hope is from him. God alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my deliverance and my honor. My mighty rock, my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, as we search for signs of hope this week, help us to become the signs of hope that others are searching for. As these candles are but a glimpse of the light of the heavens, help us to be a glimpse of heaven's hope. Amen. We are using for our um, devotional resource this year in the congregation, a resource from the Presbyterian Outlook called Apocalyptic Advent. And... Um, if you don't receive our emails, you can send us an email, in, in, uh, which you'll find in the link below, uh, to request a digital copy of that. We'll be sending those out in several ways this year. Um, we'll email the week's readings each week for the next week. Um, we'll have a few hard copies in the sanctuary for those who don't have the access to a computer or, or ability to print them at home. And there's also a link where you can uh, get the entire document online. Um, again, if you would like that and don't have it, please um, email us at the link below and we will try to get that to you. Um, I say all that to say that the sermons for the season of Advent, these four Sundays, uh, will follow some of the themes in those weekly devotionals. Um, and this week, uh, we are looking at the theme of, of the coming of God in Christ. Um, we have two scripture readings. The first is from Isaiah 64, uh, a brief reading, verses 1 and 2 from Isaiah 64. Let us listen now for a word from God. 
Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down so that the mountain would quake at your presence. As when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries so that the nations might tremble at your presence. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down. Our second reading is from Matthew's Gospel, from chapter 1. Um, this is uh, the story of how Jesus was born, and uh, particularly paying attention to the words that the angel speaks to Joseph. Let us listen again for a word from God. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said to him, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear you a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord had commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had born a child, a son, and he named him Jesus. This again is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy God, by your spirit, speak to us now. A new word from an old word a transforming word, a word of hope. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I had a cousin who, um, well, he was scared of nothing. Even as a little boy, he was scared of Well, the thing he might have been most scared of was you thinking that he might be scared of something. Um, he was, he just would take, he took the world on uh, full speed ahead. And he also never backed down from a challenge. The best way to get him to do something probably was to tell him, you know, I don't know that you can do that because he was going to show you that he could. Well, one of the stories he once told of himself in adulthood was one of the first jobs he had as a truck driver hauling logs uh, for a logging company. And it was his first day on the job, and I don't think he'd had very much experience driving a truck. But all in all, he had a pretty good day. He would, he would have the logs loaded up in the woods and drive them to the sawmill, to the wood, uh, wood yard, where he would back them in and have them unloaded. And evidently, everything had gone pretty well that day until the last load of the day. And he was at the wood yard, and he was trying to back that trailer into the space that he, to get it unloaded, and he could not do it. He backed and it went the wrong way and he pulled forward and he did it again and he had to pull forward and start over again and over and over again. This happened for a while, I don't know how long, until one of the older gentlemen in the wood yard finally walked up to the cab of his truck and knocked on the window and said, son, would you like me to back that truck for you? And very uncharacteristically of this cousin of mine, at least in my experience of him, very uncharacteristically, his response was, would you please? As he said, he knew when he was whooped. Or to put it another way, he knew when he needed someone who could do what he couldn't do, who could do the job better than him. He needed someone who could do what he could not do. In some sense, this is what it means to be humble before God for us who are disciples of Christ. In some sense, this is what moves us human beings toward God. The need for someone who can do what we cannot do. And this, I think, is a fundamental part 
of what we commemorate and what we celebrate, what we hope for during the Advent season. This is what Advent is about as well. The Advent is about waiting for the God who can do what we cannot do. It's about, it's about uh, calling on the God who can do what we cannot do. It's about praying earnestly for the God to come, the God who can do what we cannot do. Advent, I like to say, has our head on a swivel because certainly we are looking full, backward Excuse me, we're looking backward at what God has already done. We're looking backward as we prepare to celebrate the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem. We're looking backward as we prepare to celebrate Christmas at Advent. But, but we cannot forget that we are also very much called during Advent to be looking forward. Very much called to be looking forward to the coming of the God who can do what we cannot do. God has come in Jesus born in Bethlehem. But God, we believe, is coming. During Advent, we pray with John, who in the book of Revelation, in some of the last words of the Bible, prayed, come Lord Jesus. Israel prayed the same prayer. We heard it in the passage from Isaiah 64 that we just read moments ago. They used a little different words. They didn't use the name of Jesus but, in their, but their current situation was one of, of need. The people had been in exile for a generation, and now they had been brought back. Babylon had been defeated by Persia, and Persia had sent the people back home. And they went home with great hope. But that hope had not yet been fulfilled. They had not yet completely been restored. They were still under the oppression of, of the, of the power of Persia to some extent. They were still trying to figure out their way back in their homeland and their restoration was not yet complete and so they needed God. And they prayed those words we read, come down, Lord. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down. Tear open the heavens and come down. What a powerful, what a powerful image. They were desperate for the God who could do what they could not do. And so Israel prayed that prayer. And as we just said, John also prayed that prayer. John, you might remember, was in exile himself on the island of Patmos. He had been put there for proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. He was in exile and did not really know what his future would hold. He was, he was under the living under the uncertainty of empire, an empire which wanted to put down uh, those who were followers of the way, an empire whose emperor said to John and to all the people, if you call anyone God, you should call me God. And John refused to do so, so he was in exile on the island of Patmos, and he knew not what his future might be. It is in that context that he has this grand vision we read about in the book of Revelation. And it is in that context, in the next to the last verse of the Bible, that John says part of his, tells the last part of his vision, which was the one who testifies to these things says, surely I'm coming. A promise from the Christ, surely I am coming. That is the end of, G, of, of John's vision in the book of Revelation. And then he gives his response to that promise that Christ is coming. And John's response is, Amen. So be it. Come, Lord Jesus. Just as the Israelites had prayed, come down, Lord. So John prays, come, Lord Jesus. So Israel prayed it, and John prayed it, and we pray it. Come, Lord Jesus. You see, we, live, we too live in our own exile. Some of us live in an exile from loved ones. Loved ones who have already passed into God's presence, perhaps. Loved ones from whom we are separated by distance or geography or circumstance. Loved ones, perhaps, from whom we are separated by the need for forgiveness, either our need to grant it or their need to hear it. Our need to hear it. 
Some of us are living in that exile from people we love. And we need so, a God who can do what we cannot do. Some of us live in an exile from the sense of peace that God wills for us. That lack of peace can be brought about by so many different circumstances, physical health or lack there of it. A meaninglessness to the, to the everyday life we live. A hopelessness about our purpose. Um, the burdens of life. We live with a lack of peace that God wills for us. And we need a God who can do what we cannot do. Some of us live in an exile of hope. We have no hope. We look around us and the world seems so broken. So many people who are hungry and who have no place to live. People who hate one another because they uh, look different or believe different things from one another. Uh, a conflict of ideologies within our own nation. Wars breaking out in the Middle East and in Ukraine and in other places in the world. Natural disasters. So much brokenness that is so big and we don't have any idea how we can affect any kind of change in those situations. And so we have this very heavy sense of hopelessness. We live in exile from hope. And we need a God who can do what we cannot do. And so we pray with the Israelites and we pray with John, come, come down, come Lord Jesus. Now, of course, we have gathered for worship as God's people because we do believe some things. And um, as I say, sometimes I remember the, the, the man in Mark's gospel, I believe, help my unbelief. Maybe that's where we are, but we believe we want God to help our unbelief. But what we believe is that God has come down. God has come in Jesus. We read in that, in that uh, passage from Matthew that Jesus was to be named Emmanuel, which means God is with us. So we believe that God has come, and we trust that God is coming. The God who can do what we cannot do. And so we pray. We pray with those Israelites we pray with John on Patmos. We pray with all of creation. Come down, God. Tear open the heavens and come down. Come, Lord Jesus, come. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We turn now to our celebration of communion. As I've said, our Lord invites all who believe and trust in him to celebrate this meal, which he has prepared. You don't have to be a Presbyterian or a member of Indian Trail Presbyterian Church to participate in this sacrament. You may be in a situation where you don't have bread or the contents of the cup before you, but still you can pray and spiritually participate in this meal. Um, the sacrament is one of uh, promise. Um, and our Lord invites all who believe and trust in him to celebrate this, this sacrament, this holy meal, which he has set before us. Let us pray together. Holy God who is with us, we lift our hearts to you in thanks and praise because it is our joy and right for us to do so. You are the creator and ruler of the universe. You formed us in your image. You breathed into us the breath of life and set us in this world to love and serve you and live in peace with all that you have made. When we turned away from you, you did not turn from us. When we were captives in slavery, you delivered us to freedom and made covenant to be our sovereign God. When we were a stubborn and stiff-necked people, you spoke to us through the prophets who looked for that day when justice shall triumph and peace shall reign over all the earth. And so we praise you. You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, whom you sent into this world to satisfy the longings of your people for a Savior. 
to bring freedom to the captives of sin and to establish justice for the oppressed. He came among us as one of us, taking the lot of the poor, sharing human suffering, and we rejoice that in his death and rising again, you set before us the sure promise of new life, the certain hope of a heavenly home where we will sit at table with Christ as our host. And so as we gather around this table, virtual though it be, we trust that you will set these everyday elements apart for your purposes. We trust that you will feed us, nourish us by the power of your spirit in this meal, that we might have peace and hope and reconciliation with you and with one another. And we pray all these things in the name of Jesus who has come and who is coming and who has taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, on the night of his arrest, our Lord Jesus took bread, and after he had given thanks for it, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take, eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He took the cup in the same way and he said, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. Friends, this is the body of Christ given for you. And this is the blood of Christ shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes. Let us pray together. Holy God, we thank you that you have fed us in the sacrament and that you have united us in Christ, given us a foretaste of that kingdom meal we shall share in the glory of your presence. And now send us out to be a people of peace, a people of hope, a people of reconciliation, a people who, who live with and wait for you, O oh God, who can do what we cannot do and who pray constantly, come Lord Jesus. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. As we leave this time of worship, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord be kind and gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. <laughs>